Hello, my name is Tim Chapman, and welcome to another episode of my Portraits of the Landscape series. This episode takes you along with me to Vietnam for my expedition to trek to and photograph inside Hang San Dung, the largest cave in the world. First presented on the world stage by National Geographic magazine through a photo essay they published in 2011, Hang San Dung is one of the most spectacular and pristine places on the planet having only been entered for the first time in 2008. The photos they presented immediately captured my attention when I first became aware of them in 2016. The first guided trips for the general public began in 2013. To ensure minimal impact on the pristine environment, visits to the cave are strictly controlled and limited. Only one guide service, Oxalis, was granted permission to lead visitors to and through the cave. As such, Less people have been inside the hidden underworld than have stood atop Mount Everest. Just because one wants to visit the cave doesn't necessarily mean you can, as I would soon learn. Since the cave is so restricted for access, there was a long line of others who wanted to see it. An application process opened at a specific date and time for the process to start. The application was comprehensive and essential to see who might get one of the few opportunities available. When my name came up, I was then met with more comprehensive medical forms to be completed, as well as a detailed physical activity checklist to prepare for the rigors that would be entailed. The trip was very specific to ensure that I had travel insurance in place that would cover extreme sports and medical evacuation. It continuously stressed how physically demanding the expedition would be. Over the six months prior to the trip, I ramped up my exercise regimen, making sure that my legs and lungs would be up to the task. I've always carried over 40 pounds of camera gear on my back, so that was not an issue. My concern would lay with the humidity, which we have none of in the dry desert climate of Arizona that I call home. Hang Son Dung is located in the Phong Nha Khe Bang National Park, located in the Annamite Mountains in the center of Vietnam. This is jungle territory. As such, I made a trap to a travel clinic to make sure that all my shots were up to date, including cholera, diphtheria, and yellow fever. Hepatitis A and B shots were all current, as was typhoid. It was recommended to also have protection against Japanese encephalitis. Equipment-wise, since shooting in a cave is pitch black, and I'll need to rely on artificial and whatever ambient light might be available, I expect the dynamic range, the difference between the brightest and the darkest areas, to be quite far apart, much more so than what can be recorded on film. As such, I decided to take my digital gear for this trip. This consisted of my Nikon D810 and D3X camera bodies. The cave is massive, and having never been there before and seeing only a handful of images from inside, it was difficult to determine which lenses would be best. So I decided on bringing the Holy Trinity the 14 to 24, the 24 to 70, and the 70 to 200 f2.8 zoom lenses. To try to balance the extremes in light, I would also bring along my Lee filter system of graduated neutral density filters. I will be underground for five days, so it would be essential to bring along a complement of batteries so that I don't lose power. As usual, a supply of memory cards is also essential as backups and in case of failures. My bag would also be filled with silica gel packs so that I could help to absorb the humidity and condensation I might encounter. Shooting in such a dark place will require absolute stability, so I will also have my trusty Gitzo carbon fiber tripod and the Arca Swiss B1 monoball head. For personal gear, my number one essential was footwear. Judging by what the guiding services told me, this expedition would be hard on footwear. We would be traveling often through water and contrary to one's popular belief, you did not want to have waterproof boots. Instead, you needed boots specific for walking on wet rocks and fording rivers. Ones that self-drain, yet have a tough and sticky sole for grip underwater. The last thing you want is for water to be held inside your boots with you. As such, I decided on bringing some 510 canyoneering boots. It's a given that my feet will get wet. Given the amount of trekking I will be doing and the moisture around my feet moving around inside the boots, it's essential that I bring along moleskin in the event a blister appears and some anti-blister cream to try to avoid getting them in the first place. 
Quick drying, abrasion resistant shirts and pants are also must have. Something that gives good freedom of movement is essential. I am a sweat factory and generally don't do great in the heat. Anything over 20 Celsius or 70 Fahrenheit gets my internal AC working overtime. So I'll also be bringing along a buff and headbands to keep perspiration at bay. My trusty vented indie hat will help keep the sun off me during the trek to and from the caves. Flights booked, bag packed, and all checks in their requisite boxes. Time to head to the village of Feng Ya via LA, Guangzhou, China, Ho Chi Minh City, and Dong Hoi, Vietnam. I was going to be one of the first groups to enter specifically to photograph the cave. Along with nine others from Europe, Australia, North America, and of course Asia, we were supported by a team of 30, including local caving guides and assistants, a pair of Brits from the BCRA, cooks, and a veritable army of porters responsible for carrying everything from tents, sleeping bags, cooking supplies, food, tables, benches, generators, fuel for the generators, batteries, lights, it was endless. All this gear would be systematically packed into makeshift backpacks made of nylon. Looking as ridiculously heavy as they likely were, the fluorescent shirted porters, young Vietnamese men, most in their early 20s without an ounce of fat between them, handled them with the enthusiasm of youth as they stuffed them into the back of our supply truck. All packed, we drove up into the mountains for about a half an hour. The road to our trailhead followed the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Once an area disfigured with the scars of war and punctuated with the sounds of a country in turmoil. Now the thick humid air is quiet and the karst landscape overgrown with the dense jungle. Now deep in the Anamites, we clamber out and collect our camera bags for the long trek through the jungle. The porters disappear into the thick trees quickly, each carrying a veritable refrigerator of stuff on their backs. We are warned of leeches and tree hanging snakes before setting off ourselves. Making noise, like hand clapping, helps to ward off the snakes. The leeches on the other hand will find their way to your skin, usually through the shoes, but one of our group even managed to have them enter through her pant pockets. A few bloody messes would be had. After about 90 minutes of trekking down through the jungle, we arrive at the humble village of Dung, home to a few dozen and some cows. A lunch has been laid out for us by the porters who once again have disappeared ahead of us. After a quick refueling, it is time to continue, this time out of the jungle and following the river under the watchful and relentless eye of the sun. We would cross rivers over a hundred times during this expedition and I was so happy that I had brought the appropriate footwear for this activity. Having boots that didn't breathe and allow the water to drain could result in a swamp foot very quickly here, making it impossible to walk. This was not the environment to be stuck in when you could not walk. After hours crisscrossing the river as it snaked further and further away from civilization, we finally came upon the entrance to Hang In, the third largest cave in the world. We would have to traverse through this cave entirely to be able to find the entrance to Sandung. Once inside, the light of day soon gets swallowed by the dark. It was time to get out the helmet and the headlamps. After a short time bouldering in the dark, we emerge back in the light at a high point. Looking downward, we see the cave continue and a campsite set up far below. The porter team had been busy unloading supplies and setting up tents for our temporary overnight housing. I was eager to get my heavy pack and boots off, so I scurried down. The efficiency of the team was something really to be marveled at. Not only were the tents set up, but restroom facilities had also been erected, complete with a western style toilet, basically a seat instead of an eastern style squat. The cooks were already prepping the evening's meal and a dining area was also having the finishing touches applied. The campsite was nothing short of amazing. Inside the cave, with the roof rising hundreds of feet above, 
a small arched skylight for bringing in some daylight, and a large sandy area on which the tents were placed, surrounding a calm bend in the cave's river. Spectacular was a better word. Time for a portrait of this campsite. I climbed up a rocky face further inside the cave to elevate my viewpoint. I would learn pretty quickly that the dynamic range, that difference between the lightest and the darkest area, in the cave was going to be extreme. As such, I wanted to try to avoid including any direct light in my compositions. Instead, I wanted to use indirect or reflected light, as this would help to minimize the range of light I had to try to preserve details in. I positioned my composition so that the light coming in from the archway was not included, but what the light was illuminating was included. Note in this image that the brightest light is just on the other side of the wall to the right. I'm more interested in that light illuminating the ceiling as well as the walls of the cave, plus the campsite on the floor of the cave. This type of reflected light is all nicely diffused, so I don't have black, black shadows to deal with. Our nightly meal was a nice selection of meats and veggies. However, the heat had sapped my taste buds, so I couldn't really taste the food very well. Now, I'm a big fan of taste and flavor, so with all of that missing, I found myself not eating very much, even though I had certainly burned through hundreds and hundreds of calories. That night, it was time to test equipment and try out some shooting with the lights. Inside the cave would mean that most times we would need to provide all the light for the images. Ambient light from the sun would not be a given, and flash units were unpredictable in their coverage and generally underpowered for a cave as massive as we'd be shooting. Instead, we would be using powerful LED headlamps and portable 32,000 lumen lighting sources. These sources would help us control the volume of light needed to light the scene. The trade-off was that these very powerful light sources ate through their power supply very quickly, so we had to be very judicious in their use. Making sure that we only turned them on when we needed them and clicked them off quickly when we didn't. Our porters brought chargers and generators to recharge the batteries, but doing so took time and burned through precious fuel. As such, the process would be to try to find a composition in minimal light. Then we would position one light at a time, then once positioned, have them turn the light off and wait, then position the second light, etc. Once all lights were positioned, they'd all put lights on, then we'd make fine-tuning, uh, making adjustments to their respective positioning and light volume, then fine-tune the composition, try to meter the scene to determine exposure, then take bracketed exposures, checking the Instagram on the camera to make sure the detail was being preserved where it was needed. Depending on the complexity of the scene being lit, it could take anywhere from 20 to 45 minutes to set up a single shot before an exposure was taken. A lot of trial and error took place the first night, at the expense of a lot of battery power. The next morning, after picking at yet another yummy looking but flavorless meal, it was time to pack up and continue the journey to Sandung. As we emerged from the end of Hang En, another great composition was spotted. The rear of the cave was massive and provided a tremendous opportunity for a natural frame photograph. The opening allowed for a lot of natural light, which made the dynamic range a challenge once again. For this shot, I would need to ensure that I didn't have any direct sun in the composition. Since the opening was so immense, however, I also needed to hold back that much brighter ambient light so that I could balance the dynamic range to where the sensor could still be able to record detail in those bright areas while not filling in the detail of the shadow areas. The solution would be to use a graduated neutral density filter. The neutral density filter acts like a screen in front of the light so it restricts how much light passes through without altering the color. It is a graduated filter so that the transition between the screened area and the clear area is gradual, as opposed to a hard line. This helps gives it a more natural effect in the final image. I included two of my fellow cave explorers in the composition to give scale to the scene. I'm not a people photographer in any sense, but including people was essential to these photographs as the sheer size of the cave was mind-blowing. And having nothing in the image, 
that was identifiable or relatable would all but eliminate the visual impact. Back in and out of the river, winding further away from humanity, we eventually reached a point where our guide leaders met a trail, which ventured back into the jungle and up a steep, muddy slope along the side of a mountain. It eventually deposited us at a flat area that had been constructed into an area to grab some food, fuel, and allow us to gear up in climbing harnesses. Although we couldn't see it, we were mere steps away from the entrance to the largest cave in the world. Soon, we could hear the roar of the wind in the throat of the cave before seeing its entrance hidden behind dense palms and underbrush. Its entrance was found by a local boy named Ho Khan back in 1991, who stumbled upon it when seeking shelter from a rainstorm while out searching the jungle for firewood. The entrance was quite large, but hidden behind thick stands of trees. The cave itself was pitch black, expelling a strong wind from its mouth. Noting that the entrance dropped into the abyss quite quickly, the boy never ventured much further. The entrance was so remote, Ho was unable to find it again for some 17 years. It was then that its location was shared and members of the British Cave Research Association, the BCRA, prepared to enter and explore it, with the goal to map it. It would not take long before they would realize this cave was like nothing else on earth. It was massive. The entrance into Song Dung involved an abseil of a couple hundred feet. A series of fixed ropes had been set by our expedition team, which we clipped into using a set of carabiners, and made our way down into the black depths below. Once on the floor of the cave, I looked back up to its entrance, a gaping wound in the mountainside. As the daylight filtered in to fill the expanse, the mammoth immensity of the cave became very clear. I was not the only one who found themselves at a loss for words, while lost in the wonder of this place. The largest passage inside Song Doom measures about 5 kilometers, or 3.1 miles in length, with its tallest point being 200 meters, almost 660 feet, and stretching 150 meters, or 490 feet, in width doubling the size of its predecessor, the Deer Cave in Malaysia. The cave extends for approximately 9 kilometers or 5.6 miles in total length, so it's not the longest, but it is the largest by volume. The cavernous interior held the heat and humidity of the Vietnamese weather. I had always known caves to be somewhat consistent in their internal temperatures, hovering somewhere in the 50s or 60s Fahrenheit. Son Dung was nothing like that. I had been slowly overheating ever since entering the jungle, and my hopes to get underground to cool off were all but vanquished now. Sandung isn't called the Mountain River Cave for nothing. Winding its way through the bottom of this limestone leviathan was a river, whose temperature was fortunately much cooler than the air. As we would make our way through the cave, I would find myself submerging myself entirely at every given opportunity in an effort to lower my body temperature. Submerging would be quite easy as the river was quite deep in places. Chest height on a guy of my size was unexpected. As the river flows quickly in spots, fixed wires had been set to enable you to hold on as you crossed to avoid being swept away. I had to carry my camera pack over my head at a few spots to avoid an unplanned dunking, which would have put a real damper on my quest here. Further into the cave, we were plunged into a world of blackness. Without any light at all, your eyes had nothing to adjust to. The darkness was all-encompassing. It made one realize the essential importance of any source of light. I found myself intentionally dialing down the intensity of my headlamp, subconsciously going into conservation mode, just in case. Existing in a world so foreign as this, where your light only illuminates such a small part of this gargantuan place, made finding and planning compositions extremely difficult. There were no light switches to light up the interior, which I 
kept wishing would flash on periodically. Instead, I found myself studying the landscape as I would pass by it, noticing something of visual interest and then looking back at it with an increased light volume to give it context for a potential composition. It was extremely difficult and frustrating at the same time. I know I'm in some place that is beyond words, but I can only see so little of it. There would be a few times when our group would get strung out that it would offer opportunities to see more with the headlamps more dispersed. It would be then that I'd want to make a portrait. Taking a single photograph that would tie the group up for about 20 to 45 minutes again, so adjusting lights and positions of the subjects and of course trying to get that exposure and focus. Focus would be another challenge in shooting in this environment. Autofocus was pretty much useless in such a dark place, so I resorted to manual focus. I would look for headlamps of my subjects and use that pinpoint of light in which to manually focus on. This would usually work, but at times it was fruitless. The massive humidity held inside the cave caused all sorts of problems with the gear. Condensation would appear between the elements in the lenses and in the viewfinder and the mirrors of the camera, sometimes on the sensor itself. Shutter releases wouldn't work. Cameras wouldn't turn on or off. I was happy that I had brought two bodies and multiple lenses to ensure that I could usually find some combination that was working correctly. But during my time shooting, I would have a problem with every piece of equipment at some point. Even with all the silica gel packs that I had brought, they were saturated from the airborne moisture. The intermittent equipment failures would wind up costing me a few compositions during the trip until they decided to clear up on their own. I was always thankful when we would get a glimmer of ambient natural light, such as when we encountered a doline. A doline is an area where part of the cave ceiling had collapsed, allowing some natural light to seep into the cave. Sandung has two such dolines the first of which is located about a third of the way through the cave. The hole had allowed sunlight, rainwater, and seedlings to be carried down to the floor of the cave, which over millennia had slowly grown into coverings of greenery. The soft light that had descended through the small hole high above illuminated the cave interior in nicely diffused light. The temperature difference between the river and the warm air caused a mist which enveloped the area giving it a surreal appearance. The first explorers from the BCRA warned to watch out for dinosaurs in this area, and it was certainly fitting for this Jurassic type place. I felt like I had entered a time portal. We arrived at our next campsite, one of two that we would have whilst exploring inside Sundun. In true Oxalis efficiency, the cooks were busy preparing the night's meal. As much as I wanted to eat, the heat had taken my appetite. The only thing I was able to really enjoy was dragon fruit and nectarines, both of which were quite juicy. One of the other photographers with us couldn't eat at all and was battling demons in his stomach, ejecting anything that he tried to keep down. It was quickly sapping his strength, but he soldiered on. The journey continued the next day. I would continue to dunk in the river and hug boulders whenever possible to keep myself from boiling over inside. The discomfort dissipating only during the time when I was setting up for a shot. Photography is my escape that way. When I am in the zone, I'm completely immersed and nothing else matters. That's probably why I've always found landscape photography a very solitary experience for me. When the group came upon the second doe line, it was time to make what would wind up being the most technically difficult photograph I may have ever made. This dolite had a hole that was much larger than we found at the first one. As such, over time, a jungle has grown inside the cave, complete with mature trees, dubbed by the first explorers as the Garden of Adam. The ascent up to the doline was quite steep and slippery with the river crossing at the base. During the rainy season, the river could rise 200 feet in the cave. As I first saw the doline, I was across from it on a ledge. To reach the doline, I'd have to make my way down to the river, cross it, and then start the ascent. Given the vantage point and the soft light filling the doline, it was an ideal place to capture a portrait of the garden. The composition would need people for scale once again. 
This time, a staggering of cavers at different levels would help give more visual interest to the scene. Since the models would be a great distance from me, this shot would require some coordination. Each caver was equipped with a radio and a number. There were three English and three Vietnamese subjects to position. On my shoulder was lead guide Aneta, a Vietnamese woman in charge of our crew of assistants. She spoke English and Vietnamese, so I communicated my directions to her, which she relayed one at a time to each of the models. Tell number three to move closer to the rock face ahead of them. Turn on their headlamp. Now nope, turn down the volume of light. Take one step back. Again, to conserve energy, one person was directed at a time and then their light was turned off until the next was positioned and so on and so on. There were some things lost in translation at times or folks forgetting their numbers, but eventually everyone got placed. Then came the test shots to try to determine the exposure. This proved to be a challenge thanks to clouds forming within the dough line. Since the air temperature was higher in this area due to the size of the hole in the ceiling, the imbalance between that and the river water produced clouds that would grow and descend with the currents, as if the cave was breathing. I added a gradual neutral density filter and finally found an opportunity to lock focus on a headlamp. To achieve the ISO I wanted, 250, the dynamic range was still too much to record detail everywhere in a single image. I decided to let some of the shadows go completely to black. I had Aneta warn the others via radio that they could not move during the exposures, which would be long. A few more moments passed, waiting for the cloud to dissipate a bit to reveal more of the garden and improve the contrast, and then I began a series of exposures. Setting this composition felt like I was in a Steven Spielberg movie or something. It was epic in its scale and with so many moving parts. I'm glad the result was worth it. The soft, diffused, natural light of the doline also made for an epic opportunity for a selfie. We would find our last camp inside the cave. After reaching the far end of Sandung, we arrive at a subterranean lake, dubbed Passchendaele, at the foot of what's called the Great Wall of Vietnam, a massive wet limestone barrier that the water has formed into somewhat grotesque shapes, somewhat resembling something out of the movie Alien. It is here where disaster strikes. As I was trying to find my composition to photograph the wall, I slipped and fell destroying one of my cameras and lenses in the process. The light from a single headlamp is flat and lacks any dimension. When it is the sole light source in an abyss of black, it is very difficult to judge depth as there is no secondary light to help provide shadow and dimensionality. My light hit the ground beneath me, which was an extremely hard packed sand bordering on rock. Since the light provided flat, shadowless light, the ground looked like it was flat, when in fact it was rather steeply sloping to the left. When I walked forward rather hastily with my camera mounted on top of my tripod, my left foot judged that the ground was at the same level as my right, when in fact it was about 8 inches lower. This caused me to lose my footing and fall hard to the ground below, along with my camera. The camera hit face first grinding the lens front straight into the hard packed sand and leaving a perfect circle indentation as if indicating ground zero. The lens hit with such force driving the mount into the camera body, breaking it completely off the camera and destroying the mirror box. I had killed my camera. Well, one of them at least. Wanting to travel light this night, I had left my other camera and lens at the campsite which one of the British safety advisors, Adam, was kind enough to run back to retrieve for me as I tried to survey the damage I caused. He returned in short order, but the gods had other plans this night. Humidity had crept inside the lens of the second camera, which would render any images it captured unusable. Fortunately, this was the end and not the beginning, and I had already captured some amazing sights in this wondrous place.
The next day, we would begin the long journey back out of Sandun and back to Hang In, where we would spend one last night before heading back to civilization and to air conditioning. My body temp still boiling the mercury, I would soak my buff in the river every opportunity that wear it over my head. Resembling a babushka from Ukraine, my colleagues would refer to me as grandma. I took it as a term of endearment. Some 51 kilometers, or 30 miles later, I would finally reach the trailhead where we had set off five days earlier. I was happy to be greeted by an ice-cold wet cloth and a cold can of pop. I could feel my appetite returning and longing for a big hunk of meat. In air conditioning, of course. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Portraits of the Landscape. If you did, be sure to give me a thumbs up below and subscribe to my channel so that you'll know when future episodes are published. Thanks once again for watching. I look forward to the next time when I see you in the landscape.